Greetings, everyone. This is uh, Joe here, just coming at you with a uh, next session of our Bible study on the book of Romans, actually the epistle of Romans, if you want to be technical about it. And today, uh, we are going to be in chapter 5, verse 12, through chapter 6, verse 23. And if you're like me and you like to take notes, um, the name of the notes today, or our uh, session is Our Spiritual Identity. All right. Sorry for all the shadows and such. It's just no way of getting around that. Part uno. Part one. Our spiritual identity. Uh, part one. It's on 512 through 623. And just as a matter of very brief review, because you can always go back to our uh, other sessions to catch up uh, on our review. Uh, Paul is writing uh, to the churches in Rome towards the, the second uh half of his life, or the last half of his life, around 56 AD, to uh, establish a relationship with them, to unite the church. They're uh, split into factions between, primarily between Jewish Christians and non-Jewish Christians who are both vying for a place of honor and power within their own uh, communities, and also preparing the church to launch a, another missionary journey into Western Europe, uh, Spain specifically, and so the book of Romans is a book from, from a very uh, important person, Apostle Paul, to churches that he had never met. And so it's important for him to do all of this with, uh, in a way uh, in which uh, he is, he's talking to them with authority, but as, as more of like an ambassador of Christ. He's never met them. Uh, he, um, he is a Roman citizen, so he knows their language. He knows their culture, but at the same time, he has to do a lot of work within a very short amount of time, and I think that's what makes Romans so rich and uh, really just full, chock full of both spiritual and theological application. Um, our outline for the study is really built around his theme of uniting these various factions within the Roman churches, and so we've already gone over um, uh, Paul talking about our common uh, condition which is Romans uh, 1 uh, through 3. Uh, the last video was uh, on our common history, uh, Romans 4, and now we're getting into our common spiritual identity. So just to recap, the common condition that um, Paul is using to unite these factions within the Roman churches is sin, with a common antidote, which is faith in Christ. Okay. Through God's grace, not through wealth or honor or ethnicity or whatnot. And then uh, as a way of uniting them in this uh, milieu, if you like, then he talks about their common history. So yes, though uh, the Jews, Jewish Christians and non-Christians really can't position themselves one over the other in places of power based on wealth, ethnicity, honor, uh, marriage, background, history... Paul says that they all are sinful and are given salvation by grace and God through Christ by faith alone and not by works or the works of the law. But even then, they are still rooted in a common history, that of being the people of Israel and specifically uh, Father Abraham and the covenantal promises that God gave to Father Abraham. Now, when we talk about our current our common spiritual identity, he's going to talk, uh, continue, he's continuing his discussion of the common history, but he's going to go back all the way to our common ancestor uh, in spiritual terms and uh, literal terms, and that of being Adam, and the one man through whom, sal through by which salvation comes, that of being Christ. So that's what we're going to focus on today. Uh, and that's kind of the uh, outline today and the thrust for today's lesson. So let's just jump into it. Uh, the key scriptures I told you is 512 through uh, 623. And the first section we're going to read is 512 through 21. And we're going to call this Sin's Dominion. All right. Sin's Dominion. Christ's Triumph. Okay. I got this... Um, I'm trying to think where I got this. This is not my. This is not my original language. This is language I believe from 
um, the New Interpreter's Bible Dictionary. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so let's read 512 through 521 and stop along the way. I have my uh, trusty pen here. Uh, some of you may be wondering what kind of fountain pen I'm using. It's a Pilot Varsity. You can get it over the counter. It's three ninety nine. It's disposable, but it's pretty good. It doesn't bleed. Micron. Uh, if I'm going to write my Bible, and then uh, a pencil if I want to write my Bible but want to erase it later. So five twelve. Let's uh, jump into it. Here we go. Therefore, now remember, I say with the therefore, it's what is uh, it is about what's there before the therefore. So when he says therefore, uh, that is another way of saying as a consequence of all of this. Remember, we talked about them sharing a common condition and a common history. So the therefore refers back to as a result of their common condition and their common history in Abraham and in God's love proved to us that yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Okay. So therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death came through sin, so death spread to all because all have sinned. Sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is no law, yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even the, over those whose sins were not like the transgressions of Adam, who is a type of the one who is to come. come. Um, but the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through the one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And the free gift is not like the effect of one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If because of the one man's trespass death exercised dominion, okay, one of the words I want you to note here, if you're using, um, um, I'm not sure what uh, translation you're using, but in my translation we have... Um, Dominion twice we have. Let me see if I can find it. Verse 14, yet, yet death exercised dominion. So death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses through sin. Okay. And because of one man's trespass, death exercised dominion. There's that word again, through uh, that one. Much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Okay, let's talk a little bit about dominion. The word for dominion also means authority, okay? And some of your translations may say authority. But when we talk about dominion, we are using language of conquest, okay? Now, why is that important? Conquest comes from a, uh, the language of dominion, the language of authority and conquest comes from a uh, kind of a word bank, really, of, of warfare, okay? So Paul here is using uh, terms that relate to warfare. And he's talking about two different contrasting things at war, okay? And if you make a graph uh, in your notes of all of the contrasts that Paul uses in this text, like uh, in this part of the text, then I would encourage you to set up something like this, Okay to uh, note all of the use of contrasts in this section of Romans, uh, between Romans um, 5 through 8. You can write down all of the things that Paul contrasts, okay? Um, so in this section, he contrasts death with life, okay? Adam with Christ. Um, condemnation versus righteousness. All right. And he mentions over and over again this idea of dominion to point to a the language of conquest which really is the language of warfare because these two poles, okay? Death through Adam and and, and uh, condemnation, condemnation, sin, okay? Is always at war with life in Christ and righteousness. So one of the things he does is he uses rhetoric to set up the idea that the warfare that people are in the midst of should not be between Christians, between brother and sisters in Christ, whether you're a Jewish Christian or a non-Jewish Christian. Uh, and it really shouldn't even be a war between the church and the world. Um, as Paul writes elsewhere, uh, there is um, uh, we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. Rather, the warfare that we face is always within us. 
these two poles, the dominion of death, okay, and sin, and according to um, the language here in verse 17, the dominion, or what I like to use the word triumph, I think that's again from uh, um, some language that I read in the commentary, of Christ. And these two things are always at war with us. Death, which relates to fear, okay, sin, and the exercise and enslavement, and, and that always uh, struggle against that uh, pull of sin and the enslavement of sin and fear and death and those things that drive us to, to amass resources to, to, defend our, to defend ourselves, even if we're willing to take somebody else's life. The, the idea that we need to defend our honor, even if it causes harm to another, or, or uh, our need to get ahead, even if, it's, if it means exploiting communities or others, all of that works in direct, uh, direct uh, objection or in direct um, conflict with the triumph of Christ, with life, righteousness, and freedom from sin, okay? And the call to be free to serve Christ in sin, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, this is from Andy Johnson in the New International Bible Dictionary. Paul uses language of conquest, reign, dominion. In Romans, God's rectifying, reconciling invasion of Jesus Christ has liberated the audience from the death trap of sin's reign. Okay? So when we look at when Paul starts his next section here, which is, um, you know, that first section, Paul ties in a common condition, tells them they're all sinful. Now he's talking about what unites them spiritually. He's starting from a place of what is it that's really at war within us? We have a constant need uh, of this this battle because we're, we're, we're not at peace within ourselves. You know, if we can't have peace within our life, within our hearts, then we're constantly going to be at war with one another. But that's not where the warfare is. Our warfare is not a flesh and blood. It's against powers and principalities. It's spiritual warfare, first and foremost, within it, with the enemy within us, to try to get ahead, to try to uh, usur you, uh, exert our authority over others, to try to exploit, to try to satisfy our own desires and devices uh, by by trying to objectify other people or or see uh, the world as competitive. So Paul is stating that the, the building block of our spiritual identity is to recognize the battle that we fight. You know, if you're, uh, if you're uh, in the army or you're in the military, the first tactic of, of successful warfare is identifying the enemy. And then the second tactic is to uh, build the tools to, to fight against that enemy. And so that's what he's doing. He's, he's going from uh, what we call sectarian language, which I pointed out. Uh, last video, in uh, chapters 1, verses 4, well, 1, verses 3, really, but chapter 4 gets into it, to now using language of warfare and conquest as a way uh, to get us to think about that common enemy, which is the enemy within, uh, that enemy of, of the dominion of death and of sin, constantly warring against that life in Christ that is uh, marked by freedom marked by liberation marked by reconciliation and redemption and eternal life and uh, and joy okay all right <clears throat> so now we're going to move into the second part of his argument in our study today which is Romans uh, 6 1 through 14 uh, so how do you enter into God's army you know you you identify the 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 the, uh, the battle how do you wage war? What's the identity by which we, we join the ranks of God's army? And that is by way, Paul claims, uh, he already talked about faith of baptism or the newness, what I call the section that talks about the newness of life. All right, let's read it a little bit. 6, 1 through 14. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For we have been united, or the literal word, and the King James gets this right, King James Version, planted with him in a death like his, we will certainly be planted with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be destroyed, and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. 
For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion. There's that word again. Over him. Okay. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive in Christ. Therefore, okay, meaning what's there before the therefore, as a consequence of, of this, do not let sin exercise dominion. There's that word again. If you write in your Bibles, you may want to underline all these words. Uh, if you look in your translations, some have it as dominion, some have it as reign, some have it as authority, okay? Some have it as control. I think that's the NIV. Whatever it is, these words are in the same family of that, that warfare. Do not let sin dom uh, have dominion, exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their pa uh, passions. Okay, let's stop there real fast. So we talk about baptism as that initiation into Christ's, uh, as a symbol of initiation into Christ's death. So how do you destroy death? How do you destroy sin? And how do you destroy the hold over sin? You recognize that Jesus' death on the cross put to death all of this, but in going on our baptism, we're literally killing or putting to death that old self, okay, through baptism. Now, why is that important? Because in the biblical terms, baptism pointed to ultimately to God's Redemption, okay, from Egypt, okay, when the uh, when God saved the Israelites and brought them through that uh, that the Red Sea, they they walked through the Red Sea, which got split. That was their freedom into new life. That was them uh, entering into a new season in covenantal relationship with God. And so, baptism always points to this idea of of God's redeeming grace of saving and calling out a people unto Himself. The old life of Egypt is one of death, okay, enslavement, put slavery. It's one of exploitation, okay? It's one of bread at the cost of life, okay? But new life after baptism, God's redemption, is of life, it's of freedom, and it's at the living bread, okay? Jesus, who is the bread of life, who sustains us, not at the cost of life or at the cost of uh, supporting an empire, but rather living the bread of life in that new covenant with Christ. So when we talk about the newness of life, we're talking about living into that freedom, that liberation, that newness of life, that new covenant. Uh, if you read uh, the Old Testament, which we sh you should read as a Christian, okay, there is a constant pull back to Egypt. Okay, the Israelites rebelled uh, over and over again against Moses. Uh, if you read uh, Numbers especially, Numbers, okay, and Exodus. A little bit of Exodus, but mostly Numbers. There's a constant rebelling against Israelites. And the Israelites always say something like, Why did you take us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? We had bread in Egypt. We had uh, in one in one rebellion, they said, Egypt is the land flowing with milk and honey. They use the exact same words that God uses when God told Moses and the people that he was going to give them a land flowing with milk and honey in Palestine. The people rebelling use the exact same language that God uses to describe Egypt. Why did you take us out of Egypt, a land flowing with milk and honey, where we thrived with bread and had bread to eat and a roof over our heads and, and work. And the, the, um, the consequence of that, the, the ramifications of that is, is really a demonstration of this war that Paul's talking about of always being tempted to go back to the empire, to go back to a place of enslavement, to go back to a place where uh, death is, is the, 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 the one that uh, determines your your 10 hour work week or you know your 10 hour a day work week and and death determines the competition and and the the um, the daily life uh, of enslavement and bondage 
where God's redemption in Jesus Christ and, and inevitably our baptism points to new life in Christ to enjoy the new covenant through the living bread of life, God, you know, Jesus, not to mention living water, which also becomes a source of contention for the Israelites. So when Paul talks about baptism, he's invoking this, not only this battle, but also this, uh, what we call this collective memory, okay, of the people of Israel uh, that unites them in, in a struggle that has been going on ever since the beginning of time, really, Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve and the serpent, and the rest, okay? All right, so we're talking about the newness of life, and of course, um, the therefore is that Paul says, don't let sin exercise dominion, that, that conquest, that, that the, don't let the empire, so to speak, don't let the Egyptian mindset, um, the Pharaoh within our heart, to woo us, to settle for second best at the altar of idolatry, just for the sake of self-preservation, okay? Uh, and he goes on, no longer present your members to sin as instruments. Some translations rightly say weapons of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as weapons of righteousness. So now, this word for instruments also means weapons. In the NRSV, it has a footnote. In other uh, translations like the um, Christian Standard Bible, Instruments is already translated as weapons. The correct translation is weapons. Because again, Paul is using the language of warfare. For sin will not will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Okay? So what is the foundation for our spiritual identity in this part one? First, it is the fact that um, that there's this battle. We recognize uh, the enemy is, is sin and dominion of sin. We are initiated into, into Christ's community through baptism by putting to death that old self that, uh, that uh, once um, uh, framed that battle, in, which was a losing war and losing battle for us. If we are faith, uh, if, we, if we believe in Jesus and we're Christ followers. And then the next movement that he's going to do um, is uh, 6.15 through 23, which we're going to call, uh, which we're going to focus on, um, the work of the Spirit, okay? So once we are uh, become believers, we're saved uh, by faith in Christ through God's grace, uh, then when we recognize the battle within us and, and give ourselves to God, then the Spirit empowers us to be victorious over that battle. And the work of the Spirit comes in 6, 15 through 23. So let's go ahead and read it. What then? Should we sin because we are under law, not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you're present, that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? By the way, if you're still keeping that list, uh, you can see I put here disobedience and obedience, another contrast. Um, but thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Remember, Paul calls himself in chapter 1, verse 1, a slave of God. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations or, or weakness of flesh. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. All right, sanctification. It's a new word he's introducing here. Um, the root word is that of holiness. If you go to your King James uh, version, NIV and New Living Translation, the word is holiness, but it's the same word family as sanctification. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, when you're slaves of sin, you are free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage do you get then from things of which you're now ashamed? At uh, the end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification or, or that act of holiness. And the end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Sanctification. It's a big word. It means uh, sanctified is where we get the word like sanctuary. Uh, it means to be set apart. Um, the, the root Greek word is, uh, is that of holiness. So, 
like I said, the King James Version, NIV, and New Living Translation have it right in some sense, but when it's a process, it's not so much of a state of being of holy, so much as a process of becoming holy, sanctification. Let's talk last in the last minute of our of our lesson today about what sanctification is. Okay? Sanctification has three parts. Okay? It is being called out. Okay? Called out or separated, set apart. Separated. Okay, I think I spelled that correctly. Okay. A good cross-reference is 2 Thessalonians 2.13. Um, so it's that act of, of salvation, of being called out, set apart. Okay, it's three aspects to sanctification. The second is the ongoing work of sanctification of the Spirit, okay, of being sanctified. You could find a good reference in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. And the third aspect of sanctification is that moral discipline uh, in which we are responsible uh, for our training. So there's work of the Spirit, and then there's our contribution to that work. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 7, where we uh, are not only called out and separated by God, where God is the actor, the initiator, the ongoing work of the Spirit, but also where now we're taking responsibility to let the work of sanctification, the Spirit, uh, work in us. Uh, there's a good book by uh, Billy Graham called The Holy Spirit. I encourage you to read it. He talks about the work of the Spirit, but he also talks about working in relationship with the Spirit, to where we don't quench the Spirit, where we don't inhibit the Spirit. And, um, and uh, the things that we can do to discipline ourselves, to, to um, serve Christ in ways that... Uh, live into the fullness of the Spirit. And uh, this idea of sanctification is something that God does in us and through us, but that we have some sense of responsibility as well. All right, so at this point, I know I'm giving you a lot, and we're going on about 27 minutes, but that's okay. We're finding that as Paul talks about, moves to the next kind of phase of, of Romans, which really covers Romans, uh, Romans 5 through 8, He's laying down the groundwork of spiritual identity and will continue to build on that foundation of, of the battle, of the initiation of joining God's army and victory in Christ, and then of the work of the spirit sanctification. And then we'll move in in chapter 6 uh, or in chapter 7. Um, I should put it's chapter 5. It's more like 5, 12 through uh, the rest of 8. Uh, going on to the work of... Um, of that spiritual identity that makes us who we are as we live into the spirit. Okay. Uh, so I hope, thank you for joining me. I know uh, these lessons are a bit long, but I think you can stick it out. I think you're okay, but make sure to like and subscribe and uh, join me uh, as we continue this ongoing study of Romans. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below.